Hey everyone, Will and James here, E3 2016. Hello. We're here with Phil, the game director on Dawn of War 3. We sat through the presentation, we looked at some of the new features. The game is looking very, very impressive. Giant mechs. It's bigger. Giant mechs. In all senses of the word. <laughs> mechs are bigger. <laughs> um, what, what were some of the biggest differences that you guys pulled out for Dawn of War 3? Uh, so, you know, this is a sequel, so we spent a lot of time thinking about what we wanted to bring forward. Um, and, you know, the real special sauce of Dawn of War 3 is actually combining some of the best elements from Dawn of War 1 and Dawn of War 2. So we're bringing back the large armies base building from Dawn of War 1, and then put, inserting the elite heroes from Dawn of War 2 into the middle of that. And that creates, uh, you know, a, a new type of gameplay where you have big armies, but these really potent elite heroes in the middle of it just creates a really really fun over-the-top strategy game I definitely saw that um, I, and, and the addition of was it uh, Lady Solaria yeah, uh, Imperial Knight. I, I couldn't help but thinking like why isn't she just lead out in front the whole time because she's just destroying everything it was great <laughs> <laughs> well she's my favorite unit in the game right now she's an awesome 14 meter tall giant robot with Gatling guns Towers for arms. Over everything. You know, the Gatling wouldn't gun. you have Gatling guns for arms if you could? Um, but she does have, you know, there's counter gameplay there. Sure. Um, she has balancing things. One thing that may not have been clear in the uh, in the demo is that she's actually pretty vulnerable to melee units. So to answer your question, you, if you send her out front unprotected, they're going to get melee units around her legs and start whittling her down. And there's some powerful melee units out there that can really start chopping down her health. Uh, so she's best deployed with some support with some melee units to tie up the enemy and hold her a little back since she has long range firepower. I mean, it was a strategy game after all, so it would be, wouldn't be, you know. Yeah, exactly. There are no I win buttons, so it's just no fun in a strategy game. But, and some of the smaller things that I really liked was just, um, I mean, seeing like the scale of all the different parts of your army you can put together and then sending them in like you just have the troops and then it slowly gets bigger and bigger until you have Lady Solaria bringing up the enemy and it was just like, oh, this is cool, man. You're just watching them go. It was like, oh, this is a lot of fun. Yeah. James. Um, I saw that there was like a lot of strategic positioning going on. You had like leap moves and everything, uh, positions that you're fighting for. Is there going to be a multiplayer element to the game at all? Absolutely. You know, multiplayer is a critical part of Relic's heritage, of Dawn of War's heritage. We're not at a point where we're ready to release a lot of details, uh, but you definitely are going to be able to play with and against your friends in multiplayer from day one. It, it seems like it's going to be a lot of fun to have those checks and balances, you know, oh, Lady Solaria just came out, I've got a melee unit for you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've tried to build in really interesting gameplay and counterplay into all the elements. I mean, you saw in the demo this giant space laser, the orbital yes. bombardment, that's the ultimate ability. Uh, what was it, the finger of God? The finger of God. Finger yeah, of God. the finger yeah. of God. And, and I love the effect of the deaths too, where they were kind of just like lifting up and then like evaporating. Yeah, okay. we have some fantastic effects artists yeah, yeah. back at Relic, and they really delivered with that one. Um, but even there, there's actually a lot of counter gameplay involved, because instead of it being like a one trigger nuke, you actually control the beam, so you move it around, so there's a skill element. The enemy can move out of the way, obviously, but can also do things like the beam, when it hits more targets, it gets bigger, but it slows down. So it's actually a legitimate legitimate strategy to send like weak units into the beam as sacrifices to slow it down and get your more valuable units out of the way. That was something that I noticed too, is uh, it was really like thinking man's game, because it wasn't just like, let's get the most troops, move them forward to this point, blam, 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 everybody dies. Like there was thought behind everything. Even with Lady Solera, it was it was refreshing to see someone like fire their ultimate and just miss. Like yeah. some of it, you know what I mean? Like people just moved out of the way, they're like, okay, yeah. peace out. You'll hit them um, sometimes, but not yeah, every time. Yeah, and that was great. I love that, that you put uh, an element of skill into it and it's not just point and click. Yeah, it definitely has to have skill involved or else it's not a strategy right. game, right? Um, the S in RTS is yeah. strategy and, and we live up to that. Um, 
you know, the heroes give us a really interesting way to play the, play the game. You know, people who are maybe new to strategy play or haven't played in five years or whatever, you know, a, a really legitimate way to start playing is to concentrate on those heroes and do a lot of like attack moves or blob moves with uh, the rest of your line units and use them to soak up fire and then just spend time with the, the more detailed abilities with the elites. But uh, like a, a hardcore strategy player, like an RT, somebody who's coming at it from other RTSs, can totally get in and micro the hell out of those line units <laughs> and really use them effectively. Amazing. Yeah, exactly. They're, each individual unit has less depth and less health than the elites, but they're still very effective. I mean, in the demo, we saw some last cannon guys come down and just yeah. take out a heavy tank. Yeah. Like yeah. that type of gameplay is yeah, really it's good that they still feel important and not just like mosquitoes on the yeah. battlefield. Uh, how long can we expect the campaign to be? Uh, so we're not at a point where we're talking too much, but it's going to be a healthy campaign. It's actually going to take you through all three of the factions. I was going to say, I was pretty sure you guys would do multiple faction play, which leads to a lot more hours. Yeah. So. Well, and also, I mentioned there was difference. Like, there's faction differences, right? So, you know, that once you pick one and who you pick changes how things unfold. Right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so you're picking three elite heroes before every match, um, and they play a large role in what your play style is going to be. So Lady Solaria, the Imperial Knight, she's fantastic, she's huge, she's powerful, but she also costs a lot to deploy. So in a multiplayer game, or even in most campaign games, it's going to be 10 or 15 minutes before yeah. you can get her out. So you're going to be really vulnerable in that opening sure. period. If you choose like slightly cheaper heroes, you can be really aggressive in yeah. the beginning. So in both cases, so depending on who you, how your playstyle is, acceleration versus long game. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then you add in the factional differences. So if you're playing orcs or you're playing Eldar, you get completely different some completely different mechanics. You get a really interesting play space with now, a lot of variety. You mentioned uh, like people that are new to strategy games. Is there? Do you think there's a learning curve that somebody could just come in and start playing and get used to it? Absolutely. Absolutely, the campaign is really designed to be a welcoming, like laying out the welcome carpet for people to come to this game. Even people who are familiar with the franchise may not have played it for five or even ten years, right? But this is a perfect opportunity to come on board. There's no like pre-existing knowledge required. There will be familiar faces from previous stories for the fans, but we're always going to ground new people in. They'll know everything they need to know, and they can discover the depth at their own pace. Okay, so as for the veterans of the series, what would you say the number one fan service thing that you put into this game is? Uh, well, I, I would say the return of some fan favorite characters. So Gabriel Angelos is coming back. Maka, the Farseer from BL10, who is in the original Dawn of War, is coming back. Gorgut's Headhunter for the Orcs, who is in some of our previous products, is coming back. And then there's some few, a few more people that I can't quite reveal yet. Um, I think on a feature standpoint, the return of base building is something that yeah. fans have been clamoring for. Um, and, you know, we decided to bring it back because it suited the gameplay we wanted to deliver. But certainly I'm really happy to be able to give that back to the fans who wanted it. With the Excellent. base building and the Elite Heroes, now you really have the best of both worlds. So That's, that's yeah. the plan. Yeah. Don, I mean, this is looking great. Donald Ward is just looks amazing. Phil, thank you so much. You Can't so wait much, to get our hands guys. on it. it it's going to be man. great. It Keep was. it here on Press Start TV. We'll have more on this title coming to you soon. Later, guys. See you later.